Well, good morning and thank you, Warren, for reading the text. And I hope everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving with their families. Uh, I was out of town and on the West Coast, and I'm glad to be back in the red states, let me tell you. Uh, this is our fifth lesson in uh, the rise of David, a king without a kingdom. And we begin our text this morning with a new location and a new section. I want you to notice that we are in the location of Gilgal, of Benjamin, which is the home of Saul. We have no idea of the time shift that took place between verse 13 and 14. I think, personally, it could be several years. Uh, I was listening to Mark's lesson. I finally got to hear it last night. And he made the comment about in the Gospels, you are introduced to new subjects and you I have to ask the question, is this a new setting, a new location, a new subject, a new audience? And you have to be probing all the time. You see that often in the narrative of the Old Testament. You go from one verse to the next, but you are maybe uh, years from the last verse. So I think that that should be noted here. Structurally, here is the passage. Now, I say structurally because uh, when I was educated to study the Bible, we didn't really talk that much about structure. We talked about argument. Follow the argument. What is the argument of the text? And develop the idea from there. But uh, since then, I have learned a lot about structure. The idea behind structure is that the Spirit of God is guiding the author to communicate to us, and He uses certain words to structure what He's talking about. And we need to be good students of observation and look at those words and consider them. Structurally here, we have a nice frame. I call it a frame because I think of a window frame. Uh, you have the top of the frame, you have the bottom of the frame. And that is the communicative idea that we want to discuss and study. And here is the structure. Notice the top of the frame is verse 14. Look at the word depart. And you find in verse 23 that that same word depart. Now, you may have it translated as to leave, but it is one in the same word as verse 14, to depart. And so that is the frame of the author communicating to us this particular section. And depart it turns out to be a very, very important word for our study. So back to the top here, verse 14, beginning with the top of our frame. And this word depart becomes the launch point for our exposition this morning. The subject is Saul, the first king of Israel. Uh, he is a very important figure. He is the antagonist of David, and particularly through his rise. Uh, he is, uh, in my thinking, this is the probably the important time and the important place to really discuss him as a person. I want to examine the man. I want to spend a good portion of our time this morning talking about Saul. 
himself. Have you ever been audited? I have twice. Uh, my tax dollars at work for me, got that nice white envelope, open it up, got the government heading on top, internal revenue service, U.S. Department of the Treasury, my own name, my social security number. They know me personally. Uh, very exhilarating. And uh, they list for you what they are interested in. We want to examine, they tell you. Uh, and then they list the items. You have to bring your files, your evidence of what you did, and they will put that in their computer, and nobody's going to think outside of a computer, you know. And they will get back to you. Six months later, you get your letter. You're free and clear. It happened to me twice. Twice. It seems that my charitable contributions exceeded what my income profile would be, so therefore, something nefarious must be going on. That's my government at work for me. So that's what we're going to do here for the next few minutes. We're going to audit, if you will, examine the man, Saul. Two weeks back, when I was here with you before, Dan began his second lesson in the book of Ephesians. And he did so by opening up with a quick discussion on the sovereignty of God in election. The sovereignty of God in saving us apart from anything that we have done for ourselves. And he made the comment that triggered a thought in my mind. He said, you know, no one really preaches or teaches the doctrine. Now, that's certainly been my experience. Uh, any kind of a good student of the Scriptures, uh, you get in to, and listen to them, and they'll admit that it's there. But it makes them very nervous. You know, oh, oh, oh well, you know, we've got the sovereignty of God here. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about election. And then it, it, it turned them into a bunch of nervous Nellies, like they're walking down the hall carrying a, a jar of nitroglycerin or something. But, 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 we've got to be careful. We've got to be so careful. Well, Dr. Johnson used to tell us students, if Calvinism makes you nervous, you need to start studying the Bible because it's everywhere. So I want you to consider this morning and in the next few minutes, if the sovereignty of God in saving the individual is rare in it being preached and taught, well, think about our text here as we begin verse 14 this morning. The sovereignty of God in regards to the lost. Um, the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3, if our gospel is hidden, it is hidden to those who are perishing. Saul, my friends, the first king of Israel, is a lost soul. You will find no prayers of Saul in the Scriptures. You will have no psalms of Saul in the Scriptures. When Saul went to the altar, he did it perfunctorily. He... His heart wasn't into it. He was just painting by the numbers. Saul comes on the scene. He is like a meteor. A bright burst of color. Lights up the sky. And then he's gone instantly. 
That's just man. Uh, before we begin the audit, if you will, um, I said I listened to Mark's lesson last night. I listened to it again this morning. I uh, got Mark's lesson on my mind. And I thought he was very sensitive to us all by telling us in his lesson last week, now I know some of you have family members that are not Christians. And, uh, and I want to be sensitive about that. Uh, I don't have any family left. They're all deceased. But I know what it's like to pray for people that are lost, that are family members. And I want to keep that spirit that Mark so graciously gave to us last week in mind. Now, with that said, let's begin this examination I want to take note of the forceful judgment of God against Saul. Look at the immediate context. Our verse 14, if you will. It's a strong contrast to verse 13. What do I mean? Well, look. Verse 13, the Spirit of God rushed on David. But here, in our very next verse, that same Spirit leaves or departs from Saul. And if that wasn't bad enough, oh, just relax. It's going to get a lot worse. Notice, an evil spirit comes to take its place. Now Saul has a demon indoors. It's right up here, somewhere, right here. And, uh, and the idea of it taking its place triggers something very interesting in our study because that was the word that we picked up on in the second lesson, rejection. Remember? God telling the prophet Samuel, the people haven't rejected you. No, they've rejected me. And remember the word rejection? It was something in the place of. They have moved the Lord out and they have put the king in. That's what's taking place here. The good spirit of God has been replaced, moved out, or another. The spirit that now possesses the man is a sign that he has been rejected. He has been moved out for another. When the people decided to replace God for a man, a king, there is a good object lesson for all of us in that decision. I want to think that through for a minute. John Calvin said, God gives wicked nations wicked kings. I believe that's a true statement. And uh, because it's a true statement, I think we can look at Saul here this morning and he becomes the poster boy for that theological thought. He brings that message home. Men have been replacing the Lord all through time in history. That's what idolatry is all about. But we certainly see it here at home, don't we? In America today. I mean, people, men replace God with money. Men replace God with power. People even replace God for your health. I mean, we've all heard the little jingle. If you've heard, if you have your health, you have everything. 
what a lie that is. Like, this is the only existence that we've got? No. No, it is something we need to note right off the bat in understanding what God is teaching us in regards to this man and the replacement of God for a human being in the first place. When you change your love and affection for Him as primary and put it upon a man, it's going to cost you. That's what God is teaching us here. Listen to the prophet Samuel talk to Israel about their selection of a man over God, a man being a king. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 10 and following. Just listen to the prophet. He says, The king who will reign over you will take your sons and make them serve as his charioteers and horsemen. Some will be commanders of thousands, some will be commanders of fifty. And others he will take to plow his ground and reap his harvest, while still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be cooks and bakers. He will take your fields and your vineyards and the best of your gardens and give them to His servants. He will take a tenth of your seed and give it to His officers and His servants. He will take your maidservants and men servants and strong men and animals and put them to work. He will take a tenth of your livestock and you will be His servants. You got the message? He says it, the verb, six times. He's a taker. That's what a king is. It's not an endorsement for big government at all. No. The state is a taker. You replace the Lord God for a man, for a king, for a position, it's going to cost you. Here's the next thing. It's not only going to cost you. It's going to harm you personally. Look at your text. Verse 14. A harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. Matthew Henry said, when one drives the good spirit away, then of course one becomes prey for the evil spirit. Now I love Matthew Henry. Matthew Henry is a wonderful teacher. I wish I could have one one thousandth of Matthew Henry's uh, devotion to Christ and his uh, effective ministry. But Matthew Henry missed it. He misses it when he says this. Make no mistake, this is forceful punishment from the living God. That's what's going on here. I'm going to show you that. Look at the parallelism in verse 14 of the top line and line number two. Line one, of the Lord. Line two, from the Lord. The source of both spirits is the Lord. It is Him acting upon another. So that creates the tension. The tension that causes Bible teachers and preachers to go running down the hall and hide behind the organist. It is the Lord God sovereignly cursing, condemning, 
destroying a person, a personality. The sovereignty of God blesses men, and the sovereignty of God curses men. And this is God's sovereignty to punish. Now, that should really not be an issue to anyone who knows anything about the Scriptures. God gave the order to Joshua, drive out the Canaanites. Drive them out of the land. Okay, what does that mean? Push them into another country? No. It means kill them. Put them to death. Young, infants, old, kill them all. Take your inheritance. This has been provided for you, says the Lord. What did Israel do? They weren't faithful. They left pockets of people, Canaanites, in the land. They didn't drive them out. Then came the time early in the book of Judges where God said, okay, you're not going to be faithful and do what I've commanded you to do. Now you can't drive them out. Now I'm going to keep them permanently in the land to teach you something. What did He teach them? that those people grew up to be enemies of Israel. They fought Israel. They fought them in their own land, in their own place, in their own territory. Now, my friends, to reject the Word of God and God Himself, because He is the Word, it's going to cost you. If you reject the Word of God, and God, it's going to harm you. And finally, I want you to consider the personality of Saul. As he is right here, it's going to eternally condemn you. That's a fact that Peter points out when he is early in the church pointing the people of Israel to Christ. And giving them the gospel, his own countrymen. And in Acts chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, Peter is trying to make that forceful argument by telling them that Moses had said in the past that God's going to raise up a prophet, a very particular man, and you are going to need to listen to him. And anyone who doesn't listen, said Peter, will be completely destroyed. That's a very strong word in the inspired language. There's no getting around it. And not only Peter, but Paul himself, the apostle, in regards to the rejection of God and His revelation in Romans chapter 1. He says it three times. The same way he says it. With the same refrain. Here's the refrain. God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them over. He says it in verse 24 and 26 and 28. It's forceful punishment. Not just a rock rolling downhill. No, it is a rock rolling downhill that God is pushing. That's what's going on. The consequences of replacing the Lord God for anything, it's going to condemn you. That's what the Bible teaches. And we today, We today, we don't understand the judgment of God. I certainly can't understand the judgment of God. I, I know what the Scriptures say, but I, I can't possibly understand the full force of the judgment of God. But let me tell you what you can understand. 
Let me tell you what you can get. You can see the effects. You see the effects. A world turned upside down from the way it was intended to be created. Men having affections for men, women for women. We're, we're in a we're in idolatry on steroids. This world is topsy-turvy, all upside down. It is truly the day in which evil is counted good and good is counted evil. That's the effects that we see. The world is now given over to utter madness. That's where we are. That's the day and the time and the place that we have all been raised spiritually. We're to walk in it. I want you to look at these final words of verse 14. Begin to terrorize him. The important word to that in that phrase to me is not terrorize. It's begin. Sometime, someplace, somewhere, it started to happen. Somewhere, sometime, someplace, Howard Hughes started washing his hands. And he washed them again. And again. And again and again. Until Time Magazine wrote that expose on him. He has long fingernails. He is a monstrous looking personality. Walking around in Kleenex boxes. It's madness. At some place, at some time, somewhere, it began to happen to Saul. That's what the text says. Now what exactly was that? I don't know. I don't know what that was. Verse 15 is going to tell us it was visible. You could see it. The servants saw it. The effects of the demon, of the spirit, of evil that fell upon the man. But we have no idea what that was. We can speculate, but that doesn't do any good. Here's really the crux of the matter as far as I'm concerned in studying this topic of Saul. I get the theological landscape. I understand what God is teaching and demonstrating to me here. But I don't want to focus on that. Here's why. 2 Timothy 3.16 The Apostle tells us that all Scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, what I want to do myself is I want to, in understanding this man, I want to walk away with a righteous mind for me in this day and time of darkness and evil when the world is turned upside down. What I need daily is righteousness and knowing how to live. How can I walk in personal righteousness in light of what I now know about Saul? Before our study began, we began in 1 Samuel 15, right at the very end of it, when God told Samuel, we're now turning to a different program. A different man. 
Not a new beginning in the sense that God had failed in the past. No, this is what God's intended purpose was all along. That's why Saul is very important to understand. He is the object lesson for you and I to understand as we go through these lessons in the future. God sent Saul on a mission. Here it was. God says, the Amalekites attacked Moses when he was coming up into the land. Now, I have not forgotten that. And now I want you as the king to get my vengeance for me. So I want you to wipe out the Amalekites. I want you to kill the king. I want you to kill all the people. I want you to kill all the animals. I want them utterly destroyed from the planet. Get my vengeance, said the Lord. But Saul didn't do that. Saul's the politician. He picks the winners and the losers. Now we'll take this sheep, we'll kill that one. We'll take this goat, we'll save that one. And when it came to the king, hey, we'll keep the king. The king might be a good resource for us in the future. And then Samuel the prophet comes on the scene. And he said, why didn't you carry out the clear word of God? The commandment that he gave to you. And Saul, the good politician, starts waving his arms. Well, you know, you've got to understand. You've got to understand. And Samuel cuts him off. Stop it. Here is what God told me last night. And he uses a phrase, a very small phrase that we would miss. 1 Samuel 15, 17. And here's the phrase. He said, there was a day and a time that you were little in your own eyes. You would listen. You were useful because you would listen. And you were meek about it. But then you got promoted. The head of the tribe of Benjamin. Now the head of all Israel. You're the king. And you're no longer little in your own eyes. No. God promoted you. And instead of you remaining humble and meek to glorify Him and to serve others, you took ownership of what you had been sovereignly given. And you squandered it all in yourself. That's the first king of Israel. God gave the people a king, and what did that king do? He served himself. And therefore, in Saul's mind now, anything that could come on the radar that could possibly challenge him and his kingship, well, they have to be eliminated. They have to be destroyed. No. I'm now the king, and this is now my kingdom. Ask him. Ask him, Saul, how'd you become king? Tell us. Why, he wouldn't even waste a moment to tell you. I became king because I was bigger. And therefore, better. I 
What is Saul teaching us? God in His grace has given us all gifts, given us all talents, given us all ability. God, uh, God in His grace has promoted us all someplace, somewhere, sometime. What have you done with those talents? Are you serving yourself? That's what people do. Bigger, better, bigger, better. Are you like David? Who had enormous talents. Oh my friends, David in this room, you give him a weapon, you're dead. You're dead. David's a killing machine. And he recognized that. And in Psalm 144 in verse 1, he recognized that by looking at his hands and considering the athlete that God had made him. I praise be to God who made my hands for war, my fingers for battle. And he lifts up his voice to God in praise and worship for that. What do you do with your gifts? What do you do with your talents? If life's all about you, you're in the camp of Saul. Because that is Saul. It's all about me. Make no mistake, I cannot forcefully make this any more clear to you from the Bible. You live that way and you can get out the straightest of rulers and you can mark right across the pages of the Scriptures you're headed for the judgment of God. You know why? Because Paul tells you that. Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Read it for yourself. Here's what it says. They neither glorified God, nor did they give thanks to Him. And as a result, judgment. Judgment. Who among us? Who among us, any of us? can be proud of the Christian life that we possess and the blessings that we have. I certainly can't. I'm talking to Dr. Johnson one time about the doctrine of sanctification. And he shocked me by saying, how do you define my life? This is one of the greatest scholars of the Bible I had ever heard. And he said, you define my life by one word, sin. And that's it. None of us are clean. None of us have clean hands and a pure heart. We are always indebted to the grace of God for every breath we take, every day we can live. We are debtors to Him and His marvelous and wonderful sovereign grace over us. Now, what are you going to do with it? You're going to live for His glory. You're going to reach out and help others. You're going to be saved to serve. That's the profile. Not yourself, others. Counting others better than yourself. Now, Saul, Saul is important to consider, to ponder, to think through. And here's what the upshot of it all is. The self-centered life is the destructive life. It will destroy you. It brings the forceful judgment of God upon people. And so here, in your mind, we're planting a flag in the text. 1 Samuel 16, 14. 
Up goes the flag. From this point forward, we will see the disintegration of this man. Slowly, surely, wasting away. Looking like a buffoon. Always where he shouldn't be. Always doing what he can't do. Running around with his flags and horns, with his cavalry in circles. Never getting anything accomplished. Not only the destruction of the man, but the ruin of his kingdom. And it starts right here. God is teaching us. God is educating us. I was listening to Martin Lloyd-Jones, 1966. And he said, the great problem that we have today is that people are not knowledgeable of the Word of God. You have received the Word of God today. It's about a man. Don't go his way. You will regret your life. You will waste your life. Spend your life wisely on others and the glory of God. And you'll be grateful in 10,000 years that you did. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for our time of study this morning. Thank You for this life of David and for what You have taught us regarding the life of Saul. Very informative. It is Your message to us for today. Now may we receive it by offering up hands to You in praise for our salvation, in open hands to serve, to glorify You, and to be a people of Your own. Believer priests to live and honor You in all that we think, do, and say. And we ask this in the powerful name of Jesus our Lord. Amen.